Today we are uh, studying the general epistles. This is a survey of the general epistles, so if you'll turn to the very first general epistle, which is the book of Hebrews, yes. Um, we are currently uh, not going verse by verse, but we are looking at the themes that are found here. We're kind of going through all the books with these themes. We passed out this particular sheet uh, last week uh, with a list, a tentative list of the themes that we are tracing through the general epistles. Does everyone have one of these? You can have mine. Last week around, we'll need to print some more then. We'll have them next, next week for you. We, um, these particular themes we're tracing as we go through the general epistles. Last week, we looked at the theme, the last days, which I should be the first on your list there. The last days we identified as the days immediately before the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. On the board here, this chart, um, this would be uh, when Christ returns, right here at this big blue arrow. So the last days would be the days that are immediately prior to that. Now there's another term, the latter days, that... Um, refers to as the prophets were back here they talked about the latter days so the last days would be the last days of the latter days and we identified them precisely as being the days immediately before the return of the Lord uh, we began looking at the verses that indicate believers living during those days are looking for Christ's return. And when we talk about the return of Christ, we're talking about this event here. Now we are currently in the church age, so we are looking for the rapture of the church for Christ to take us out of here. Uh, these scriptures here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, refer to that event. So for us, both of these are future events. Once we're gone, the people that are living here who come to know the Lord during this time will be very, it'll be very interesting for them because this event would have already happened. So they're not looking for that. They will be looking for this event. We also mentioned that during this time, as people come to know the Lord from reading their Bibles, they will, they will wonder what happens here, and they, they will uh, start reading their Bibles, and many will be saved because of that. As they get saved, they will, there will be a lot of preaching during this time. But at the time the Lord comes back, there will be nobody on earth that would have been saved for more than seven years. So they will all be considered babes in Christ. That's why John refers to them as my little children. See? That's why Peter refers to them as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Because they will be new believers during that time. So uh, as... As they come to the end of this time, we looked in the book of Hebrews, and it says, after those days, certain things will happen. So, as they look back to the last days, they will be referring to them as those days from this particular event back. Now, since these people will be looking for the return of Christ, and the general epistles now, while they were written, 
back here early in the church age and they uh, can apply uh, historically to the people that they were writing to at that time. They can apply devotionally to us all through here the doctrine, the specific teaching applies to the ones that are living immediately before Christ comes back. And we're going to see that in our study. So these people are looking for Christ's return. Uh, as we get into this, we'll see certain, uh, certain uh, words, key words that we'll be looking at. But this is the second coming, not the rapture of the church, as we'll see. Uh, we'll see terms like revelation, reveal, his coming, the day of the Lord, the light, his presence, his glory, etc. And all these terms refer to this event, not to this event here. The rapture of the church, per se, which was clearly... Um, revealed by Paul in his writings is not mentioned in the general epistles. Now there is one term called his appearing that we see through, through uh, the New Testament can refer to both events, but there are differences. His appearing here at the rapture will only be he will only be seen by us okay? the uh, unsaved world will not see Christ here but this event here the Bible says every eye shall see him there's a big difference there because when he comes back when he appears here it will be for all and uh, so I wanted to make that distinction as we get into this. Let's look at some verses here. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We have, um, many can quote this verse here. It's a popular, 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 popular verse. Uh, verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but extorting one another and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Now, usually when we hear this verse uh, talked about or quoted, it's in the context of you need to be at church on Sunday, <laughs> right? You've, you've heard me, don't, don't skip church uh, because we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But the context of this verse, it's uh, talking about the day of the Lord. They see the day of the Lord approaching. In the context, look back to verse um, 16. Go back to 16. It's talking, of course, to the Hebrews here, Hebrew believers. It says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. That's the last days. <clears throat> after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds will I write them. This is toward the end that this happens here. And it says, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves because you see that day approaching when I will come and write the law in their hearts, you see. That is approaching. We'll discuss that more when we get down to the item of uh, the uh, salvation, the national salvation of Israel that's on your list there. When we get down to that one, we'll discuss the mechanics and all the details about what happens here on when it's when it's talking about that day that's approaching. Uh, that will be a really, really interesting.
interesting study when we get to that particular event. Uh, so we see this in Hebrews. Look at James 5. We're going to try to stay in order so we can just uh, scan right through these general epistles. James 5, look at verse 7 through 9. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord. See? Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. The judge standeth before the door. Now, I can't apply the church, see, because our judge at the judgment seat of Christ is in heaven. When we go to be with the Lord, we will appear at the judgment seat of Christ to see our uh, receive our rewards whether you know we have them or not uh, so and yet it's talking about the coming of the Lord and he is the judge that is coming back do you see that context there that this is talking about to be patient to the coming of the Lord they're having to endure a lot of stuff here and he's telling them be patient be patient the Lord is coming back and he will put an end to all this that you're going through. Let's look also at 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verse 5. Speaking to the believers here, he says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to re be revealed in the last time. Ready to be revealed. There's that word again, revealed in the last time. Skip down to verse 13 also if you will look at that. Verse 13, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's not this event, that's this event. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Got a whole book written about the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is this event. So he's talking about when it talks about the end, that means Christ will be putting an end to all this that is happening here. So hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Talking about the second coming. If you skip over to chapter 4, verse 13, it says, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. They're going through a lot during this time. And they are suffering because of Christ, because of their testimony about Christ. But rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. It's talking about the revealing of the glory of Christ. Now Peter had seen this before. Peter had seen Christ in his glory. Where did he see that? On the Mount of Transfiguration, remember Jesus was transfigured before them, and they saw him as he will appear here, and it took their breath away. So Peter had seen a glimpse of that, and he's talking about a time when his glory will be revealed see, again. It's not this. Christ is not going to be revealed to the world here. But he will be revealed at that time. Uh, let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. For we 
have not followed cunningly devised fables. We'll come back to that in our study of false teachers and false doctrine. Mm -hmm. But for right now, let's skip over that phrase and go on. When we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's still referring back to that Mount of Transfiguration there. He remembers how Christ looked. See? Uh, look at chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, in which the heaven will pass away with great noise, and the elements work, uh, will melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. And you say, wow, that's not going to happen right here, is it? So what does it mean, the day of the Lord? Keep in mind that earlier in that chapter, Peter said, for a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day with the Lord. The day of the Lord which begins here is this entire thousand year period. This is the day of the Lord. It begins here. So the day of the Lord comes in a, as a thief in the night, but at the end of the day of the Lord, the earth and the heavens will be destroyed. Do we see that? He kind of lumps it all in one thing. But the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, but the elements will melt with fervent heat, it says, there. So this is the whole day of the Lord. And it's talking about this event. And not talking about this event here. Now some people think of this as the thief in the night. No. The thief in the night is always this. You know what Jesus said about thief, thieves? He said in John, what, 10? The thief cometh not but for to kill and to destroy. I am come to give life. So he's not coming to destroy here. Okay? He's not the thief. But the thief comes here to kill and destroy his enemies that are gathered together against him. That's the day of the Lord that is mentioned so often in the general epistles. Look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. John is talking. The true light is coming back. He, he now shines. Uh, this Deuteronomy 33, 2 describes the return of the Lord as he shines as he comes back. It will be a very bright return. Yes, sir. If he's coming like a thief in the night, mm -hmm. and he's coming back as a shining return, that seems to be contradictory. Seems to be contradictory? Mm -hmm. Well, it's describing the event in two different ways, I would say. <clears throat> uh, as he comes back, on his enemies, he does come as a thief to destroy. Okay? That's the John 10 verse. That he will come as a thief in his destruction. But he will come and every eye will behold him. Revelation 1, 7. Every eye shall see him. So he's not hiding from anybody. Yes. I, I think, is it just like He's not coming as a thief in the night where it's dark and he's going to sneak around, but it's a surprise. It's, it's the a, of yeah, surprise. it's it's a surprise. 
people on earth, even though they've been told about it, don't see it coming. The believers to which these books were written are looking for it. They're awaiting his return. They're being patient until his return. So it will not be a surprise to them, but it will be a terrible event for his enemies. Um, let's go to Jude, chapter 1, obviously. <laughs> if you find Jude, chapter 2, please show me your Bible after we're going to take a look at it. Verse 14, it says this, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That is also mentioned in Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 2. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Enoch was the one who was taken. He did not die. Enoch walked with God, it says. But he was a prophet. And he prophesied about this event before Noah's flood. And he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And you know, we will be among those thousands of saints that come back with him. He's not coming back just by himself. Uh, he's going to come back with all the believers at this time to set up his kingdom. Matter of fact, right after he leaves, it says there was silence in heaven about the space of a half hour. <laughs> it's like, where'd everybody go? <laughs> yes? Now when it says 10,000, that means an unlimited number. That's true. When it says 10,000, <laughs> you just can't number that. It's millions and millions and <clears throat> can't number it. So we see that this event here was prophesied long before. In verse 24 it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you fall from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. When he comes back people are going to be the, those who are lost are going to be weeping. They're going to be scared. They're going to be running to the hills trying to escape his wrath. But for the believers, exceeding joy. We're going to see here, it talks about his glory. His glory. The earth will not see his glory here as we are taken out. They'll just look around. Where did those crazy people go? You know? But here, he appears with his glory. And this is the event that is reported over and over in the general epistles. Look at Revelation 1, verse 1. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of him, which God gave unto him, to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The book of Revelation is a general epistle. Now it does contain a lot of prophecy, but it is a general epistle that John wrote. And he's talking about the return of Christ, the revelation which shortly will come to pass. Now, as he was writing this over on the island of Patmos back in 90-something A.D., we know that there's a whole bunch of time that's going to pass.
pass. A lot of years will pass before this. But as these people pick up the scriptures, they see it is shortly going to happen. Look at uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I got that wrong. Revelation 1, verse 3. Revelation 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things for, that are written therein, for the time is at hand. I got that messed up because I'm kind of looking at it at a very acute angle. And then verse 7, look at uh, verse 7 of chapter 1. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. For the vast majority, this is going to be a terrible event for those who do not know him that are on the earth, you see. But it says there that he cometh with clouds. Remember when he left in Acts chapter 1? And the disciples are standing there looking at him. He was received up into a cloud. What did the two men who stood by tell them? This same Jesus will, will come, come back just like you've seen him go into heaven. They saw him. They'll, people will see him when he returns. He went up into the clouds. He will return with clouds just like before, visible. Okay. And that is not this event right here that they're talking about. We've got to understand that the general epistles are talking about this event, and it will describe how they should get through these terrible years. <laughs> these terrible years. Okay, we're going to start this. I don't know if we're going to finish it this morning, but this, the next item that we're going to look at is the foolishness of depending on riches. There are people that put all their, their faith in their riches. This has been true since Adam. People think just because I've got a lot of wealth, I am secure. I'm okay. And we're going to look at that. Turn, if you would, to the book of James. Flip over to the book of James, chapter 5. Look at verses 1 through 3. He says this. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And ye shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Again, the last days are mentioned. The thing that jumps out and hits me here is that it says your gold and your silver are cankered. They're no good. They're worthless. Now, up until this time as we speak, gold and silver have been the solid investments, have they not? There are people who say, well, I've got gold. It's always going to buy something. 
During the last days, guess what? Gold and silver will not buy what they need because the beast is going to say, unless you take my mark, you can't buy and you can't sell. Somebody that doesn't have the mark of the beast in their in their right hand or in their in their forehead, no matter how much gold they've got, will not be able to buy a loaf of bread. And the gold and the silver are cankered. That has never been true until this time. We're running out of time, so we're going to stop there. We'll pick up with this next week. Uh, we're going to probably knock off two or three or even four of these items each week as we go along. But we're looking at things in the general epistles that are applied specifically during this time. You know, God has scripture for every day and time. And while these are the scriptures that are aimed at us, these are the scriptures, the general epistles that are aimed at these people. Okay. That will make a lot of sense to you as we study these things and we learn more about the general epistles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, it, you promised that if you study it, you'll show us, that you'll teach us uh, things that you want us to know from your word. Help us to be faithful doing that. Lord, help us to be always ready to give an answer to someone that asks uh, why we believe in you. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.